Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and maybe good afternoon, depending on when you're joining from. I see that we have a few of our uh, old friends here. Uh, so welcome, uh, amongst other people we have here with us, Christian and Raymond. So you guys are very welcome and hopefully um, there's a few other people that maybe I haven't recognized there just by the names that you put, but I'm sure that we have some old friends and some industry um, experts as well here. And this is good news because we have with us today two super industry experts and I think you're going to really enjoy this session. We're talking about O&M uh, for CSP plants. We know that is a complicated part of uh, for CSP, you know, operating a plant properly can make a huge difference um, in terms of the output uh, and how the plant uh, behaves in the future. With us today, first of all, we have Cristina Prieto from Avengoa. Cristina, say hi and where you're joining from, please. Hello, I'm joining from Seville in Spain. Excellent. So we have Cristina in Seville. I am in Madrid, as you know, and also we have with us Daniel Quinones, he's the operations manager of La Africana. Uh, Danny, can you say hi and where you're joining from? Hello, hi to all of you. I'm joining from Cordoba. Excellent, thank you very much, Daniel. So these guys have got, I don't want to say decades because they're so youthful, but they have a lot of years of experience operating first-hand CSP plants. And they're going to be telling us today what is the best practice. A lot, uh, the, the o and uh, for CSP plants is complex, but it's something that has really come a long way in the past few years and things are becoming a lot more optimized and things are becoming better. So we're going to hear from these guys that have um, such great uh, inside knowledge. First of all, we're going to hear from Christina, then from Daniel, and then your questions, you can send them through the box at the bottom, the Q&A box, and we will get to it um, as soon as they are done. Um, also, share with us where you're joining from. I can see that we have Pawan from India, so it's obviously late afternoon in there. Welcome, Pawan, and please just share uh, also your companies. And Christina, would you please share your screen? And let's start with your presentation, and we'll take it from there. And for the people that are currently, uh, whilst Christina gets herself ready, remember, we are recording this session. We will send you the materials, okay, in a few days. So you will have your hands on the materials, not to worry about that. And make sure that you send us your questions because this is truly one of these webinars where we have people that really know a lot about this topic and that, um, you know, the knowledge um, makes a, a, a difference when understanding the nature of, of how this works. Just make sure to unmute your microphone, Christina, when you're ready. Hello, Ross from Australia and Christian from Berlin. Okay, are you ready, Christina? Just make sure to, hang on, I'll unmute. Now, it. yes, because I was mute. Okay, so firstly, I want to say hello to all the participants in this uh, webinar and yeah, my presentation is a summary of some aspects to be considered in the operation and maintenance of CSP plan. And this summary came from our accumulated experience with more than 21 plants in operation. Uh, in this map, we can see the distribution of plants that we have in the world. Avengoa operate more than 20 plants worldwide. And to have some number on mine, we have a background of uh, 1,500 megawatt of parabolic draft collector in operation, near 100 megawatt of tower in operation, more than 200,000 tons of molten salt in TIA system in operation, and more than 20 steam accumulator in operation. And to do it, we have about 900 people in our OMM team around the world. And the question is, how to organize that? In order to guarantee the success of the multidisciplinary teams that participate in the OMM, uh, the organization uh, has to be implemented in a very uh, well, in a very good way. It's a key issue. Our organization is based on guaranteeing similar o and structure in every plant with equivalent positions and functions and also with centralized service that allow visibility of all operations, procedures and incidents. 
uh, regarding O&M structure, uh, as we have said, um, we want a similar O&M structure in our plan. And for that, it's important to simplify management and control of the plan. It's important uh, to improve communication at the same level of management, uh, guarantee the transference of experience between the different organization management blocks, and allow the comparison of the organization blocks performance continuously. Uh, to have this similar structure is key to maintain equivalent position with different with, with same functions that makes easier to uh, the replacement of backend position this provides homogeneity for performance evaluation and makes easier the transmission of know-how and simplify the training processes and finally the ONN organization in Navengoa has a competitive advantage. The definition of centralized services guarantee an optimized use of the synergies between, the, between different plans. This optimization guarantees greater efficiency in the plan operation and a significant reduction in cost. To do it, three centralized services are defined engineering services in charge of centralized performance analysis, a standardization of engineering and operation procedure, a DCS support, and another. We have operation services in charge of homogeneous operation management processes, or for example, a new operation processes support. And, fi and finally, we have the maintenance services in charge of homogeneous maintenance management processes, predictive maintenance, uh, solar field optimization, or solar receiver replacement or alignment, and the maintenance of clean uh, tracks. If we talk about management, the management of o &M in Avengoa is based on a good definition of work procedure, a correct definition and monitoring of key process indicators, and the use of a specific tool uh, developed in the company in areas as um, operation area, for example, in the definition of, of a work permit, in the engineering area, some internal tool uh, for management of change, of or distribution and, or an implementation of lesson learned. We have also tool in, in maintenance area, for example, in the definition of uh, annual plan, and we have tool in health, safety, and environment. For example, we have tool for audit, we have tool for safety and environmental inspection, housekeeping, work and talk, well, a lot of tools that uh, we use in our plan. Um, it's very important that we have general o &M management procedure uh, where we establish the general guidelines. Uh, we established uh, the modus operandi uh, with the different department, and we also established the internal coordination meeting among uh, the different plan organization blocks. And we have to talk also about a specific OM procedure that are continuously in development uh, with the lesson learning in our plan and in our technology te department. We control the standardization of this specific procedure in all our plan, and we audit the use of these procedures to guarantee the implementation. Finally, it is key to, to make a correct recruitment and training policy for the staff. We are located in different geographies with uh, available local resources that must be selected and trained. If we regard the main challenge to be faced in new geography, we need to consider that the new plan can include 
a new technology thanks to the implementation of lesson learned or a specific requirement of the country. Uh, that the transference of culture and ways to do is more complex in remote geographies. That expats have a high cost and mobilization time is limited. So the training of local personnel must be done especially uh, for local key position. And finally, uh, to have enough time, the selection process starts two years before expected commission. If we regard training, uh, mainly for key position, uh, we have created an internal program based on integration of local key personnel into plan for training during a long period, at least one or two years. Uh, the program has training in management procedure and ONN specific management tools. The program also uh, allow living the day to day in the plan next to the homo hom homologous position and promote uh, during a certain period uh, the supervision by the assigned uh, trainer. Finally, the program gives additional support to be provided by centralized operation and a maintenance department in a new technology issues. To conclude the presentation, I show some practical tools used uh, during training as the advanced plant simulator that allow to take experience on daily plant routine as startup, full load generation, cloudy uh, transient generation, generation strategy based on thermal storage system or plant shutdown. Uh, this system also allows to prepare crews for incident response. Finally, we recommend the integration of experienced personnel from commercial uh, inactive o and team in plan coming into uh, operation for supporting your team. I know that there are a lot of specific issues related to o and in CSP, but well, unfortunately, uh, this is the time that I had. Thank you very much for your attention. And well, I am full available for any question now or here you have my contact data if you want to send some question by email. Thank, you, Thank so. you very much, Christina. If you can just stop sharing so that we can allow Danny, whenever you're ready, Danny, you can share your screen. This is very interesting. We're looking at this or Christina's looked at it as they, uh, you know, they have a huge portfolio from the Avangoa side. How do we deal with this? How do we go in new areas? How do we trade personnel? This is very, very interesting. Uh, it's, it's a management issue, really. There's lots to do. You have to make sure that everybody's at a certain level. And now we're going to be looking, and he's going to be looking more in a plant in a specific. Uh, how are they improving things? What are they innovating on? Go ahead, Danny. Okay. Hello, everybody, first of all. Um, uh, as Melen is saying, I will go a little bit more on the ground, meaning that uh, on the plant itself, all the tasks and actually we'll just try to um, to tell a little bit of our lessons learned and our experience here. I will try to share. Okay, so first of all here you have, uh, uh, this slide is just to say that uh, even if we are called uh, La Africana, is something that if you are not from here in Spain, you would, you would think that we are in Africa, but we are exactly in the south of Spain and the name just came with the field, the ground where it was constructed. So we just adopted that name. That's where we are Africana and we are set in Cordoba, a, a city in the south of Spain, uh, where we have beautiful monuments uh, like uh, Mezquita and uh, we are surrounded uh, with a lot of olive oil, olive trees, sorry, and this is not just a landscape beautiful that we are having, but it's also some issue at the end, well, when you are on the spring, because maybe in, 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 in Africa or, or in Asia, they have that, some, that, that powder coming from the desert and that, but here we receive uh, like the seeds of, of all those olive trees 
during the spring, so it's also uh, having an impact on the on the clean cleanliness of the solar field. Okay, so some features uh, regarding our plant: we produce 55 megawatt uh, in steam turbine. Of course, we have 168 loops in the solar field that allows to uh, to produce and also to store up to 950 megawatts hour thermal in molten salt storage. Um, we have three gas boilers of uh, that. Uh, that's that means for uh, 45 megawatts thermal that we actually only use for uh, anti-freeze purpose because even if it was at the beginning uh, allowed, let's say, uh, or, or it has interest to uh, to use them for increasing production, and that now is it has no profit in Spain due uh, due to the regulations. Uh, low water demand. This means that we, are, uh, our consumption is uh, lower than six cubic meters per uh, per megawatt hour. Um, we can generate up to 180 gigawatt hour electric gen uh, on a year. Uh, and the last topic is the uh, one point that I will stress later on that it will be the 24 operation um, making a continuous uh, of production during more than 24 hours and. Last year, we achieved 45 days continuously uh, of 24 uh, operation, uh, uh, 24 operation hours. Okay. So, trying to uh, to, to to share that lessons learned, I will uh, divide into to to side to say from the production perspective and the maintenance per perspective. Uh, in, from the production perspective, we have. Uh, the molten salts. I, I have a stress here that the molten salts makes the the real difference, and this is something that it was not so clear since the beginning. But now, of course, it's absolutely clear that it's it's, it's the added body, value that we really have, and that 24 hours operation that, that we'll uh, talk about later. And after that, from the maintenance perspective, where I will just share our way we do it here. Okay, from the production perspective. First of all, just a, a very short introduction. I can, I believe, uh, all of the, the people that is listening uh, knows about the, the molten salt system. But just briefly, we have a, a, a standard, let's say, a, a CSP plant uh, has a solar field that delivers a, a oil to produce a steam. But in a plant that you have molten salt storage, you also take a part of that um, oil uh, warm on. Uh, heated on the solar field to um, storage that energy in, in molten salts. You have two tanks, one is a hot tank and uh, another hot uh, cold tank. And you uh, you have a balance there where you are during the day uh, increasing the level of the hot tank and uh, in the night you discharge emptying that hot tank uh, through a heat exchanger that uh, will uh, deliver the energy to continue running during the night. So once again, uh, the thing is, uh, the main idea is molten salts storage make the, makes the difference. And as I mentioned before, this was not so clear at the beginning, but now for, I think it's general, but in, in, in my case, of course, we, we believe in that here because of this kind of benefits I showed, just manage energy dispatch. And this is something that from the internal point of view is very interesting, that, uh, as you will see later on with the rest of the items, but uh, also from the external point of view, from the uh, uh, the grid administrator, it's something that mm, uh, in all the, uh, mm, the, the, the places that I, I have heard them uh, talking, they demand uh, how to integrate all that energy and this, uh, this possibility of managing the energy dispatch is uh, one thing key that, that they demand. There are countries that is the main the main key to to build or not this kind of plants okay uh, you can cover the clouds uh, dna falls and this we will see now and optimize the economic uh, income income and uh, again the 24 hour operation that, that we will talk about uh, regarding the covering the cloud dna falls uh, i choose this uh, i took this uh, trend to to show a little bit i just explained uh, because it has also one one thing else important to, to see. Uh, this trend shows uh, in the green line, it, it is the, the level of the uh, 
hot tank of the molten salt system. Uh, the DNI comes on these red lines and the blue line is the gross production and the orange you can see here is the net exported production. So with this blue arrow I'm pointing to the point, to the, to the area, the time in this uh, graph where we see that we have the DNI falling uh, um, and going up and down. So there was a moment when it was not enough for continuing with a good uh, production. So we decide here to discharge and you see that how the green line that is the level of the, cold, uh, the hot tank comes down. But starting since the beginning, and this is the other point I wanted to show with this uh, graph, we can see that as we started uh, uh, increasing the power at the beginning in the startup, we received a, a technical restriction from the grid administration uh, telling us to reduce our uh, production. So uh, we had to produce, as you can see here, this blue uh, flat line, let's say, uh, for a while. and. Uh, while they tell us, told us to, to be at that uh, power. And this is something that uh, in, if you have no uh, molten salt storage, just will uh, go to, will uh, directly mean that you are losing money there. But we are, uh, as we are having that molten salt storage, we are storing uh, more, uh, in a more uh, high uh, level, let's say, the, the, the hot tank. Okay, so we are not losing completely all the uh, opportunity of that energy that we are receiving. Okay? So uh, once again, uh, with this uh, molten source, you can have that flexibility that otherwise you couldn't. Uh, regarding the economic income optimization, uh, just showing here a, a trend where you see in every column the market price uh, for every hour. So in this uh, day, you can see that in the, in the last hours of the, of the day is when you have the higher uh, market prices. So uh, you can shift your production just by storaging during the day, reducing the, the power uh, that you are exporting, but storaging more energy for the last period of the day where you know that you will get a higher input, a higher uh, economic uh, income. And now the, the 24 hour operations, uh, I just write here that it feels good for the plant and here are some of the benefits that I will uh, tell you now, but just coming back to the, first of all, to the uh, graph, to the trend. Uh, again, we have the blue line is the power, the green line is the level of the hot tank and the DNI are these kind of these curves. So you can see that uh, I just, I'm just showing a couple of days of uh, last year where we came uh, discharging during the, the, the night and when the, the DNI arrives, uh, then we started, we increased the, the power just uh, using the energy that we received from solar field. But also you can see that we start in, uh, increasing the level of the hot tank, meaning that we are charging the, the molten source system at the same time that we are producing, of course. So uh, when the, the DNI falls at the end of the day, then you are in a, in a level on the hot tank that you can start discharging and this will continue during the whole night. And uh, again, the next day, you can start doing the same without stopping the, the plant. And this is the key, uh, an important thing, to continue operate the plant without stopping it. So uh, I'm showing here some benefits uh, from the production side. I would say that uh, I will be completely honest, it's not that you will see a, a high increase on the production actually is more or less the, the same uh, energy that you will produce during the whole day. So uh, it comes uh, more with the rest of the benefits that is uh, mainly these maintenance benefits that is uh, the key, especially in the turbine, but it actually comes with all the, the, the systems. The key uh, parameter that uh, leads uh, to to, to the maintenance of equipment, especially in the turbine again, is the what it's called the equivalent operation hours. Uh, and that uh, is calculated uh, multiplying the number of stars that you do of that turbine or the rest of the system uh, by a factor that actually that factor is not low uh, and adding the, the, let's say the standard uh, running hours. That means that if you have a lot of starts and stop, that will increase the equivalent operation hours in a way that will 
demand the maintenance of the of sound systems and the plant in general earlier than if you don't start and stop. That's why we believe that this is a, a big difference and a big uh, benefit. And regarding the cost benefits, uh, uh, the, there are all the auxiliary supplies that we usually use uh, are reduced because, uh, for example, in the gas, we are not using the auxiliary boiler that use that gas for sealing the turbine while you are not uh, running it. So um, if you're continuously running the turbine, you are not uh, spending uh, any money on that gas. The, regarding the electric power, you are, whenever you are not offline, you are not consuming energy from, the, uh, from outside. And regarding the water consumption, again, uh, uh, at the beginning, in the startups, you have, you have to do some uh, purges uh, that you are not doing if you are continually, continuously running. Okay, the intermittent purges that are called. So all of these supplies are also reduced, and this is a, a very high cost benefit that we believe that uh, is one of the points um, for doing whenever it's possible that 24 operations uh, in the plant. Okay, just here, the, I am showing uh, in this actually it's, it's two the, two years ago. Uh, yeah, some groups of days that uh, where we when we were producing in this case it's i think it's 11 or nine nine days here and four in the left so of course when i say that we have done for uh, 54 days of continuous 24-hour operation means that there are blocks like this when you are mm, running for 10 days continuously after that you have to stop because there is no uh, radiation at all so you stop for a while for one day or two days until you again have the, the chance of starting with this operation. And from the maintenance perspective, and just trying to, uh, to tell a little bit of our experience or our philosophy that is use predictive techniques uh, because these predictive techniques, and when I say predictive in difference to uh, pre preventive means that uh, you, all, you will always uh, follow a certain parameter or parameters that will let you know if you have or not to do whatever maintenance. It's not that you have to do maintenance in, on a regular basis, but just whenever it's demand by that uh, parameters. The parameters are delivered by all these, uh, all the techniques that I will uh, just, just say before, so uh, later, sorry. And this will reduce the maintenance cost whenever you're not uh, doing maintenance when it's not required, but only when it's required, then you reduce the maintenance cost. Uh, that will increase the uptime of the plant whenever you're not stopping on a regular basis, but yes, when it's required, you have more time of uh, uptime of the, of the equipment, okay? And use, uh, you will use that follow-up techniques. That means that they, this is, these techniques that I show here have will deliver a, a certain parameter or, or some of them showing you when you have to uh, to do that maintenance or not. Here we, we have all the, we put in use all these techniques like thermal images uh, analyze, in this case is a, a steam trap of the turbine showing you if it's, if it has leaks in, inside or not, uh, vibrations, fre uh, frequency spectrum analyze. Uh, if you use this uh, kind of analyze, you will you will know in advance what is happening to your uh, rotating systems. Uh, oil chemical parameters analyzed, uh, this is very important and it's something also that uh, coming back to always, uh, you're, you don't have to change with the cost that it uh, uh, takes the, the oil in all the parts, but only whenever they are required to be changed and that comes with the analyze that is telling you if it's really need, required to change or not. Uh, another technique is uh, ultrasounds analyzed uh, for uh, checking uh, bearings and, and le external leaks. Uh, BD scope inspection, that's something very standard, very important. And uh, mirrors reflectivity. Regarding these mirrors reflectivity, um, it's just again the same philosophy, the same philosophy showing that you we don't clean here the solar field just on a regular basis. This is something that uh, many visits 
uh, that comes here. Uh, ask when are you or how often are you cleaning? And the answer is that we are not uh, cleaning the, the mirrors often or not. We are cleaning on demand and the demand comes with a parameter that in this case is the reflectivity of the mirrors. So whenever we see that uh, the reflectivity comes down is when we really start cleaning. And another point uh, regarding the, uh, the experience here is that we, we, we believe that it's good to use the state of the art techniques, like in this case, for example, for detecting the, uh, uh, the, the losses of vacuum in the absorber tubes of the solar field. Uh, you see here on the, on the blue picture, let's say, how clearly you, you, you can see the losses of the vacuum with the thermal, thermographical uh, camera, thermal camera. And actually we're using also a drone that uh, going up to a certain position, some of them positions, it's showing always the same picture. And then it's very easy to see uh, when you have or where you have that vacuum loses. And finally, just uh, this is a project that we are developing here in an optometric light analyze for proactive HTF steam leak detection on the solar field ball joints. The laser, we are using some lasers just to detect uh, in advance uh, uh, the smoke that generates uh, uh, the leak that you might have on, on a, a ball joint of the solar field. So that's it. Thanks and uh, hope, uh, well, hope you, you like the way we do it. And I'm putting again the last slide just to show my contact. Mm. Whenever Thank you, you very much, Danny. You can contact me whenever you require. So you leave it there for a few seconds and then um, when we go to the questions, then you can take it off. I have to say, I'm constantly impressed. I visit uh, L'Africano quite a few times and they're always, you know, working away in something new that uh, makes finding an issue faster, fixing it faster. And I, I'm always impressed by your, your ingenuity, guys, you know, and the way that you resolve the issues. So mm -hmm. it's really good. It just, it means every visit is different and new. Mm -hmm. And now you're working in some really interesting things that I know you guys mm -hmm. can't say yet, but I think you should come back next year and tell us uh, what you've managed to do because they're working on some really innovative things. And it just comes to show that Mm -hmm. You know, if you put some effort into making these processes better, they really do become better. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a bunch of questions, loads of them. So, uh, let me just throw them out. Since the two of you are technical, then, you know, feel free um, to answer them as needed. Okay, here there is one that is uh, interesting. There is a lot of questions, actually two issues that come up time and time again. One of them is how many people, how many people, how many people are needed? What happens if you have three or four plants together? Do you need less people? Do you need more people? Uh, is it tower? Does it need more or less people than parabolic trough? So I don't know if you guys want to sort of generalize a little bit about it. So how, how can you really like use less people to do more really? How, how easy is that? So I don't know who wants to take the question first. Maybe Christina has the knowledge of different plants there because I... Okay. Just take your, take your, your slide off now so that okay. we can see Christina better, please, Danny. Yeah, the issues of people. Okay, so um, we have similar stuff in O&M for tower than for trough, basically. But it's true, we can optimize uh, the number of people in our, our plant when we have several plants together. We have this example in our in the platform that we have in Spain, in in Solaben platform or in, in Extremadura platform. And um, take into account, for example, that uh, in, we can have 40 people per plant in Traff and Tower, in Oanan. Um, but if you add uh, more plant, you can use the same uh, control room, so that means that you can optimize uh, operation people in the panel and you have more flexibility uh, to manage the maintenance people on site. So to have a number of mine, around 40 people per plan in tower and in trough, and if you have several plants together, you can optimize this number 
because you optimize the people in the panel in the control room and also you can uh, give more flexibility uh, for the for the maintenance staff so you would share the maintenance team between the three plants that's what's the difference right right mm, okay if we have maintenance people on site in charge of, for example, as Daniel has explained, for vibration or for thermography or for uh, the annual uh, maintenance uh, shutdown or for the day-to-day -day corrective uh, maintenance tasks. Um, we have a maintenance people in the centralized service for all plant worldwide. For example, in charge of uh, aligning uh, in the solar field or, or, or certain tasks more uh, generic and that happen not as often as uh, other uh, problems uh, that you have uh, in the daily operation. So on site we have maintenance people for predictive and for corrective maintenance and this is if we have 40 people 66 percent of these 40 people uh, belong maintenance department and 33% is uh, belong, uh, belong uh, operation. And basically this is the distribution and you can, we can optimize perfectly if you, we join different plant in the same location and we also we optimize the, the people because we have this central, centralized service uh, for, for all the plant worldwide. Yeah, I see. So you, in some ways, the people that you have on site are not as much in your case because you move some specialists around. These are all people that are like not outsourced, right? There are people that work directly for Avengoa on a permanent basis. Right. Okay. Danny, you had something to add. We can't hear you. Hang on. Now, no, now, now we can. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, in our case, if you want to know uh, how we do it here, we uh, we are less than 50 working here and uh, yes, I, I understand that whenever you have more than one plant, you can share uh, some of the people between and it's, a, it's you have a benefit uh, on that. In our case, I, what I would say is whatever people you have on the plant, try that they are the best, that they feel comfortable there and they feel the plant like is their plant because that's the key whenever you are working there, if you believe in what you are doing, the people uh, will keep it working properly and keep it uh, in the best way. That's, that's why when people come here on the visit, they always say that it's very clean and everything. And the thing is that we try to do that because when you have something in your hands that is uh, well maintained, you will try to uh, keep it like that and continue like that. Yeah, not for nothing, the Africana works so well. So a question to both Christine and Daniel. Do you consider a training simulator for CSP plants to train operators and to assess their performance? And if so, what are the aspects of the operations that are more appropriate? Uh, solar field, power block, balance of plants. So do you use any training of this sort, either of you? We cannot hear you at the moment. Oh, now we can, yeah. Okay, um, I can tell you, here we don't have that. We don't have that kind of uh, simulator for uh, for training, but I understand that it, it would be nice to have, very nice to have, because that will um, speed up the, the learning, of course. And yes, I mean, it would be nice to have. I think that uh, um, Avengoa has it, and, and it's very nice because, it, as I mentioned, it, we here, what we do is we put the people for learn, uh, first of all, reading all the procedures, after that sitting, with a specialist to, te to tell him about uh, the, the global process. And after that, they sit behind the operator just to, to learn exactly all the, how, uh, how to, 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 to manage exactly with all the valves, pumps and everything. Mm -hmm. So learn by doing. How about you, Christina? I am not sure if we still have her here. Seems that maybe she's frozen or something. So let's continue with some other questions. Uh, so um, this we asked the already. Area. And basically, the, it's critical for us, uh, the behavior uh, in the solar field, uh, for example, the aiming strategy in, in a central receiver, 
um, the best way to do the startup of the of the turbine, the aligning with the turbine, different procedure for how to start up or for coal startup. So yes, just to, to be sure, uh, we have training for all part and section uh, that are involved in the uh, operation and maintenance in a in, in a CSP plant tower and trough. There is here a question that you both may be able to answer. It's like, which is more, which is more cost effective and profitable way operating a 24 hour plant? I mean, it's a bit, I think this question is a bit off, but it, it, it is a, it's an interesting question nevertheless. You guys have in many plants sort of eight hours of uh, molten salt storage perhaps. Is it worth operating it um, through the night at half load, do you do you have enough time? You know, do you push to do the 24 hour thing and, and, and avoid the startup? Or do you produce more energy at once? I don't know, Christina, maybe you start. Um, from the one end point of view, uh, the operation during 24 hour is the best one. It's the best option because the most part of the problem came from the uh, daily start up and shut down um, the gradient that you have in the equipment uh, the thermal shock that you need to avoid in order to guarantee the life of the of the equipment um, uh, operating during 24 hours uh, the material don't suffer uh, from the from, from the thermomechanical point of view and the time that you need for preheating and for, for cooling and for the transition between the different uh, ways or mode of operation, take into account that we can have more than 20 uh, ways of operation in a solar plant. If you work during 24 hours, it's much, much, much easier, the operation, and you have less uh, maintenance issues. So from the point of view of ONN, it's much better to work uh, 24 hours. And from the point of view of profitable, of course, <laughs> you reduce uh, in a significant way uh, the cost, but you need to make an, an optimization study, the feasibility study, uh, in order to compare cost of solar field versus cost on energy that you produce during 24 hours have to be uh, compared in order to see which is the best uh, which is the best number of TS system of hours in, in the store that you need? Is nine? Certain state, studies say that is nine is, is is the best option, and certain state, studies say that twenty four hours. So it depends. On How about you, Dan Daniel? Maybe you can add something. I think I have put it clear in my slides because I am. Let's say that I'm a believer on that twenty four hours operation. Uh, I see clearly, the, uh, especially uh, in the maintenance of the plant, you see that uh, whenever you are doing that operation, the only uh, notifications that you get from, from the maintenance uh, of the plant is things like uh, the, ball, the, the, the light bulbs that are uh, broken or things like that, but nothing to do with the problems uh, that you usually have whenever you are starting and stopping. And that, like for example, we are having, uh, when you're doing starts and stop, you're having always problems with uh, uh, leaks on the mechanical ceilings of the pumps and um, on the valves and things like that. That kind of things are completely over whenever you are doing this uh, operation. The plant uh, works smooth and enlarges the, the life. Uh, as I mentioned before, the equivalent operation hours of the plant and especially on the turbine, will uh, be redu reduced dramatically. So that uh, will lead to a longer period between uh, the maintenance of them. So that's why uh, we believe that that's the proper way of doing uh, things. 24 hours makes the difference again. Thank you very much. There's actually a couple of questions more, you know, here about, you know, um, startup time and lost energy you, you save by not shutting down. But I think I'll consider this answered. Um, how often, this is for you, Danny, do you, often, do you experience grid curtailment in Africana? Do you experience it at all? We can't hear you. Hang on. Now. 
Oops. Now. Okay. How often do we receive what the technical restrictions? Grid curtailment means they tell you you cannot put energy into the grid. It, okay, that uh, a few years ago at the beginning, it was more uh, often that we, we received that kind of uh, orders not to start or to reduce the power. But since two years, we haven't received any, any uh, restriction. Uh, actually, we have to tell the, the grid administrator, we have to tell to Red Electrica in our case, uh, what is our minimum uh, power allowed to have a, a soft and, and a smooth uh, production without uh, putting in risk that, that, that production. Okay, so um, at the beginning we received quite a lot of them, but now we are just not receiving absolutely. Anyone. This is great news. <laughs> yes. um, okay, so I'm going, I boiled it down all of this. I know there is a lot of open questions, some of them are repeated, but I boiled it down to three different questions. These are the last three that I'm going to ask you. First one is some components. There is a couple of questions there about, you know, how often the tubes break, how often, uh, you know, it's kind of very specific. So maybe uh, the question, I'll make it a little bit larger as in, you know, what are the components that are perhaps more problematic, you know, and if you want to mention anything about, you know, tube like or mirrors replacements, you know, if you have any percentages of anything like this, that could be useful. So Danny, why don't you start and then we'll go to Christina. So components in general, which are the most problematic and it's a few percentages if you have in like the key components, that'd be great. Okay, so uh, well, I would say we have some key points that are the, let's say the weakest points of the plant. First of all, uh, the ball joints, the ball joints of the solar field are the, uh, the, the junctions that we use for, for allowing the movement of the, of the mirrors. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is one of the weakest points of the, of the plant. So um, you have to do a good maintenance of that to maintain and, and to, to avoid the possibility of having any breakage there. Until now, we haven't had here, but I know that it has happened in other places, and it's a very important and, and a very bad point if you have that kind of leaks. So that is very important to, to have a good maintenance there. Uh, second, I would say that the, there is another um, important point, as I mentioned before, is the, the leaks on the mechanical ceilings of the main pumps, the oil pumps. Uh, for that, uh, you have to First of all, you have to uh, keep, again, a, a smooth uh, operation of them, meaning that you, have, you, don't, have, you don't have to stress them, therm therm uh, put them there any thermal chalk on them and, and try to, to run them smoothly. Okay, and that kind of things, whenever you are starting and, and stopping, uh, that leaks on the mechanical ceilings are appearing more often than whenever you are uh, running the, uh, the pumps continuously. Okay, so that's another uh, point that I would say it's important. Um, what else? I mean, I think those two points are, are important. Also, maybe the uh, the valves on the on the thermal storage system, uh, even if everything is uh, traced, to have high temperatures there to keep high temperatures there on, on the molten salts fluid. fluid and, uh, there are always a small leaks on the. Uh, ceilings of, of the shafts of the, of the pulps that you might uh, have outside and that kind of uh, things you have to take in account just to maintain it uh, clean enough and, and not having problems of blocking that, that valves. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Anything to add, Christina? Well, Daniel has explained perfectly <laughs> the main issue in parabolic trap plan. Basically, as he has mentioned, uh, the, the ball joint in, in the soil field and, and, the, and the seals in, in the process system, oil, and, and, and the TIA system. Basically, the heat tracing and, um, and the insulation material when you need to guarantee low heat losses in your facility. Um, regarding the uh, tower, uh, it's, it's different. It, it's more related, again, well, it's related to, to the leak in, in mechanical ceiling due to the, uh, the preheating and the, and the continuous uh, startup operation. 
Um, also, we have um, people working continuously in the hydraulic mechanisms in order to guarantee the aiming uh, of the aliostat. Um, this is, is not as significant from the solar uh, field point of view. Um, the maintenance problems are not as significant than uh, the, the problem that we have in, in, in parabolic traffic. And regarding cost of maintenance, basically the main cost uh, came from, from the uh, technology, I mean, from the uh, revision and inspection that you need to do, for example, in the power block and the inspection that you need in the turbine. And it's something that is defined by the uh, technology supplier. And this is one of the most uh, important uh, uh, costs that you have in maintenance and one of the most important issues that, that you need to consider because it's a long uh, term shutdown uh, without operation and you should uh, consider this, uh, this uh, works in your performance model. Thank you very much. Evelyn, just one thing that I would like to mention, sure. maybe. Go for um, it. Well, uh, regarding the main, one of the main points that you have to take in account for avoiding, avoiding uh, to, to lose a lot of time because of a downtime is uh, another system that is a, the steam generator and the heat exchangers on the molten salts. That uh, it's something that is not, it's not that you have to maintain doing, doing anything special inside very often, but what you what you have to do with that is to uh, maintain it by doing a good use of it, not stressing again the system, not putting that thermal shocks when uh, on it whenever you receive the energy coming from the solar field. And if you do that uh, operation uh, smooth, then it shouldn't have any problem. Okay. Okay, so we have to go because, uh, you know, time is short, but just one quick, quick question for the both of you. I'm not going to have time to ask the third, but the response time of the molten salts, when you have to switch over and use the molten salts rather than the radiation, how quick and how quick is that? This is for parabolic troughs, obviously, because molten salt towers are differently. So, Daniel, how long does it take? Okay, so... Um... This, uh, the, the startup of the turbine depends on, on a parameter that is, is the, the temperature of the shells of the turbine, okay? So if you have that shells in, in, in the summer, usually you have them warm up, then the, the startup will, will be really fast. If it comes with the sun or if it comes with the molten salts, it, it will take no more than five minutes to be running in, let's say, 85% of the maximum power. Okay, so um, that kind of uh, period, and uh, if you have low temperatures on the shells of the turbines, and you can avoid that by uh, pre-warming using uh, uh, gas boilers for uh, generating steam and putting that steam ins uh, inside the turbine, without production, but just pre-warming, okay? um, if you have that low temperatures, uh, then it, will, it can take longer, and longer means from zero uh, it can take uh, 40 minutes uh, to to take the mark to, to arrive to the maximum achieve the maximum power. Thank you very much. I don't know if you want to add anything, Christina. You're quite happy with the answer. Oh, well, I think it's clear. A lot of people is working in the in a faster uh, implementation of the TL system, playing with the maximum gradient that you can uh, have in the in the steam generator and uh, in the heat exchangers. Uh, this, it, this is a key issue, and uh, there are a lot of development uh, in, in, in the sector in order to optimize this parameter. Um, but let me say that that depends on the strategy that you have in your plan. For example, we have different strategy in Spain than in the United States, depending if you use the TS system in order to maintain the system in warm condition 24 hour or not, it depends if you have boiler or not. So this time depend also of some parameter defining during the design of the plant. Excellent, well, thank you very much. It's been a lot of questions you've gone through and thank you very much also for being so kind and sharing with us uh, what you know, your strategies. 
Thank you also for the people who attended today. Danny, thank you very much. Christina, thank you very much. We'll see you in the next one. And hopefully we want to keep uh, covering CSP. It's a topic that is close to our hearts, as you know. So watch out for the next events and uh, hopefully see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye-bye.